All right, folks, I'm here again with uh, Dakota Cohen, and today we're going to be answering any questions that you guys have got. We are live streaming from our homes, and uh, it's been a couple of weeks since we had Dakota on the show, so uh, I'm bringing him back in. His video hasn't started quite up yet, but uh, basically today we're going to be talking about um, whatever you guys want to talk about. So I know Dakota had a few questions in the queue on his end. I'm just going to change the view here. And um, you're welcome to put questions up into the chat um, and I'll keep an eye on it. Um, and we'll try and uh, get through a few questions over the next hour, maybe two, depending on how busy you guys are. If you're just signing in and uh, please let us know where you're signing in from and we'll get to your uh, questions as they come in. Hey, Dakota. Can you hear me, Dakota? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Looks like your bandwidth is a bit low right now. No, my uh, all my speakers and stuff were all crossed there, so it was coming out of my my speaker thought it was my mic and vice versa. <laughs> okay. All right. Sounds good. All right, folks. Uh, yeah. Let's just, if you're just signing in, let us know where you're calling in from. Hey, Angie. Nice to see you. Hey, Lynx Acres. Hey, Pierre Lafond. Hey, Grouchy Frau. Uh, nice to see you guys all here today. Um, if it's possible and it's a fit, uh, we'd love for you to share this on social media and get the, the word out that we're live today answering questions or questions about permaculture or anything uh, related to this uh, whole COVID thing. We're really hoping to do a show tonight, kind of getting into the nitty gritty details. So people want to get into those, they're more than welcome to ask questions. So first question comes in from Pierre Lafond. Um, Hi, do you know any formula for swale design in regard to precipitation, ETO, and soil type? That's a super technical question. Um, swales are one of those things, Pierre, and I'll let Dakota talk to this too, but they're kind of um, as much art as they are science. And um, the, the best way that I've found to kind of size swales is, is based upon uh, the observation of water flow um, in our climate specifically right around now. And so uh, you'll probably see some content coming out from Dakota in the coming weeks about uh, the melt that's going on uh, on his property right now and how that particular melt pattern leads to um, uh, him sizing his swales. And I know Dakota, you've, you've, you've done a fair, a various uh, types of or sizes of swales on your property. So you probably have some things to add to that. Yeah, so the um, like this this is a super detailed question. So I'll I'll, I'll kind of go through, build off what Rob said, and, and then give some examples based on uh, my context. So the um, the and I'll actually I'll use the the kind of the five step process that Rob and I use in our uh, consultancy because this is. Um, uh, like, like a lot of these questions, the answer is it depends. And well, what does it depend upon? Well, first thing, it depends on what your goals are. So uh, why do you want a swale? Is the swale designed to divert water into a dam? Is the water the swale designed to infiltrate water into the soil? Uh, are you going to be growing trees along it? Uh, you know, just a bunch of those kind of clarifying what it is, what the function of, of the swale needs to serve in your design. And then from there, that'll inform your designs around what the form of the swale looks like. Um, so first you start off by clarifying your, your vision values and resources. Second step is you would take a look at diagnosing your property uh, via various uh, characters. You already mentioned a couple of them, infiltration rates, things like that, um, doing some tests, but, but it also depends greatly upon your uh, climate what form of precipitation you're trying to harvest. Because if you are in a dry land environment and you're harvesting rainwater, the swales are gonna be very different than if you're in a cold climate like myself and you're trying to harvest snow melt. So um, I don't have a lot of experience with dry land swales. 
because I live in a, in a cold climate. And uh, I've, from what I've heard, there's actually, there's certain contexts where swales don't make sense. Um, I can't remember, what's, what's his name, Rob, the fellow down in the States, Craig Sponholtz. Uh, yeah. I've never, I've never met him. I know Rob's worked with him, and Craig is not a big f- fan of swales. He's a he's a water harvesting expert uh, down there. But um, the reason he's not a fan of uh, of swales is he used them on uh, from, from the stories that I've heard. He's used them on his property uh, in the dry land uh, areas where he was trying to harvest rainwater, but with uh, with rain runoff. In, in silty soils, your swales can fill up with uh, erosion material, basically silt, and it can create damming inside of your swales and they can over, the water can overtop and it can create huge problems where you were actually trying to you know, infiltrate water and, and use it to heal the landscape. It can actually make things a lot worse. So uh, definitely be careful with, with the swales. And, and I, again, I don't, I don't know what, what climatic context you're you are uh, calling from, but from from a cold climate. Now I'll speak to my uh, my particular context. Is uh, we are all of our swales are designed, and I've got videos up on my YouTube channel. Uh, if you look, just YouTube Dakota Cohen. Uh, I've got a channel there that shows a bunch of stuff. And, um, the uh, because we are not harvesting rain runoff, we're actually harvesting snow melt most of our swales, or so all of our swales are uh, typically very large, very deep, um, and uh, they're designed actually So <clears throat> this is something I've learned just through observation is uh, because the swales often fill up with, with snow and things like that, um, you can get ice damming and, and uh, a lot of uh, issues like that. So <clears throat> I actually set the swales to hold zero water. Um, and then the snow actually holds a considerable amount back on itself. And then I, I raise my spillway heights with boards or sandbags or straw as is necessary. Um, but um, so I think some other rules of thumb here. So <clears throat> another way to look at this is, Rob mentioned this, you have to figure out, diagnose what your water source is. So is it a point source or non-point source water flow? How much water flow is coming in? Um, the So on our property, like, we are only harvesting water that falls as snow on our property. So there's no like river or creek ring that flows onto our property. Uh, from somewhere else. It, it does melt from drifts and then comes out from there. But um, those are all considerations that will change the overall size and shape of your swales. And like, there's a huge variation, like you can, um, and then there's also the, the type of, of equipment you're going to build it with, whether it's an excavator or a bulldozer or a grater or by hand. I've, I've used all of those uh, with the exception of a grater on our place and they all leave a different shape. And um, so I don't know if that helps to answer the question, but but essentially my process was I started digging them by hand and I did a lot of experimentation because the first swale I ever built was in my area. And unless you, there's somebody in your area who has one already and you can go and learn from their observations, that's where I would start it is very, very small. Um, but also even asking the questions, do you even need it? Like uh, so many people want to build a swale and they fail to realize that building swale does not change the fact that you don't have water. So unless point source, um, building a swale isn't going to help anything. So really, uh, you know, clarify your goals, diagnose your property, and then and then come up with the design and the implementation and, and a, a monitoring and management plan to make sure that it's right. In, in All right. Um, so the next. Uh, Hear me? Yeah, the bandwidth is kind of cutting in and out there, Dakota. So, 
So while we're uh, we're just sorting that out uh, on our end here, uh, the next question is from Lynx Acres, so I'll take it. Um, do you think it's possible to find five to 20 acres vacant, sectioned off a quarter section, zoned to build a house and farm later for under $20,000 within two hours of Leduc? Um, I'm not, that's asking a lot. I mean, I look for a lot of land around that region and um, you're basically asking for it's just that you 10 acres uh, as a rough number. So you're basically trying to find an acreage for about $2,000 um, an acre. And to be honest, there's just not a lot of land in Alberta that, that when you get into these acreage um, plots that cost 2,000 bucks an acre, typically you'd get kind of $2,000 an acre on really poor agricultural land and you're buying more than a quarter section at a time. Um, when we get into acreage size plots, um, the price per acre tends to go way up. And so um, I know one of Dakota's friends just purchased, um, I think it was five acres of land. Um, I think five or six acres of land. What was Luke's property? Well, four. Four acres. And I think that was like in the 70 to $80,000 range, something like that. Yeah, 70,000. No, no power, no water, just yeah. access. And that's, that's pretty far out in the sticks. So uh, compared to, you know, being close to Leduc, so to speak. Um, so I, I think that your budget's probably a little bit low. However, that might change uh, after this whole um, COVID thing, hard to say. But I think you need to go up in your budget a bit. All right, uh, next question. Um, Fiza Fiz, uh, Anwar. I'm from Southern Ontario, interested in the online PDC. If I don't have access to land at the moment, what kind of design projects will we be able to complete? Um, man, in fact, when we teach the course live in person, we actually recommend that you go design somebody else's property. And I'll still make that recommendation. The reason being is that when you're designing someone else's piece of land, you don't have the, um, uh, the bias, so to speak, the attachment. And so you're able to make much more critical decisions, at least for your first design. So you could do a, a community garden, you could do somebody else's farm. Typically for the PDC though, we wanna start with a small design and work up. So you have lots of options. And uh, one of the things that Dakota and I have been talking about on the back end is like, how do people take the knowledge that they gain now in permaculture and over the next one, two, three years, build that into a career? Because I think that the trend is gonna change after this disaster. Um, and people are going to start looking at self-reliance uh, and resilience and um, all the stuff we talk about in permaculture in a totally different light. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Dakota. Yeah, no, that, that all sounds good to me. The, you, you just need to, to have, have access to a property that you know reasonably well and that you can travel to to do the exercises on. Um, and uh, as Rob said, in a lot of ways, there are a lot of benefits to not designing your own land first, uh, because you can make you can make mistakes on somebody else's place. <clears throat> so I guess the the criteria is someplace close and uh, that you can visit during the course to run the exercises, and uh, that's about it. Okay, so the next question is. Um, um, is it a good idea to put a swale at the bottom of a septic field? And the answer is no. Um, I mean, there may be some situations where it's not no, but generally speaking, we don't want to be infiltrating water um, close to the um, to a septic field because, um, well, I mean, basically the septic field is designed to infiltrate water. And so if you start infiltrating massive amounts of water next to a septic field, you're going to compromise its ability to infiltrate. So Yeah, I mean, it, it basically already is a swale. <laughs> basically, yeah. <clears throat> okay, next uh, question from Monica Trong. Thoughts on swales in a city lot in Calgary. And so I'm going to reframe that question. Um, urban lots are basically just zone one, zone two gardens. So uh, in any zone one or two space, you can use it if it's going to help you. Um, Dakota, I know, has a massive garden in his zone 
I'll call it a zone two, probably zone one. Um, and there's no swales and, uh, you know, it works really well. And so, um, for us in our urban environment, uh, in Calgary here, where we, uh, you know, have this property in South, uh, Southeast Calgary, um, it's really nice because when the tanks overflow, it automatically gets dealt with in, um, in our garden. Um, when you start scaling up, it's probably a pain in the butt to, to do what we've done on anything larger than kind of the scale of, of garden that we've got here in Calgary. I don't know if you want to speak to that, Dakota. No, again, I think it comes down to, it's like, like again, what are your goals? Like, would the water, would you, would you be better off harvesting the water in a tub so that you can grow vegetables with it? Or, or have you already done all that and you still have excess water leaving your property that you can't find anywhere else to put it to productive use and so you're trying to store it in the soil? Uh, in that in that case, it does make to make sense to build a swale. Um, and uh, now, the, of course, the the um, there are some other considerations to think about. Like, for example, do you have a basement where infiltrating water close to your foundation might be a problem? Like, you know, do, do you already have a sump pump that runs twenty four seven? Because if you've got that, you don't want to be infiltrating any more water than you've already got. Yeah. Okay, here's another question. I'll let you go at this first and then I'll, I'll round it out on the end. Um, is it from Miles Rose, is it better to buy raw land to build a homestead from scratch or buy an acreage with a house and infrastructure already in it or on it, which might be poorly designed from a permaculture perspective? So you, you take a stab at that first and then I'll, I'll come in. Yeah, so I mean, again, this this really depends on on what your goals are and what your resources are and what your time frame is. Um, so, a couple different scenarios is like if if you if you already have a really good setup that's secure and you have the time to build something from scratch, um, that's obviously the best scenario because it's going to be perfect for what your goals are. But um, if there's challenges between like where you're buying and where you live now and you have to move out there quickly, uh, Rob and I have this uh, uh, formula that we, we call the, um, the four Bs. Uh, and uh, you're only allowed to do one of the Bs uh, at a time. So there's uh, building, uh, babies, businesses, and beasts. Actually, there's a, there's a fifth one uh, uh, if you're if you're a real newbie as well, which is which is bushes. So if you're going to try to build a house, start a business, have kids, start raising livestock, and plant like perennial fruit or nut nut crops, there's only one of those things that I recommend doing at at, at once, because the level of complexity and um, observations that that is required to make sure that they're successful uh, is just I, I'm sure you've all heard of the, you know, the the divorces that happen or the the marital problems, when you know people buy the sacreds thinking it's going to be all great and easy, and they move out there and they try to do way too much, and they burn out. Um, so that's something else to uh, to think about is uh, like, okay, what are your resources? Are you are you ri ridiculously skilled? Are you do you have you know background in carpentry and and earthworks and all this stuff, and you you can do all that stuff, or is it going to cost you more to have to pay somebody else to come in and um, and do all that work for you? So I don't know that that's uh, that's the way that I would approach it. Is again, it it depends. Uh, Rob, what are your thoughts? So I mean, we looked at land for ten years. We looked at land, and we looked at buildings, uh, or built lands with buildings, I should say. And uh, at the end of it all, when I, when every time we went to go get a mortgage on a property, the banks would basically attribute zero value to the buildings and the people selling the buildings attributed the moon to the buildings. And so there's this huge mm -hmm. gap between, um, uh, you know, what the owners wanted and what the bank was willing to lend on. And so it's always hard to kind of bridge that gap. It got even harder when we tried to buy raw land because banks will not attribute any value to raw land, which is just, just hilarious. I mean, um, I think the, the, the reason they don't do that is because they know that the average person has to make a living and has to live somewhere. And so if they're paying a mortgage on raw land, they can't be renting or paying a mortgage on a house. And so that's their reasoning behind it. Um, and so 
um, over all these properties that we looked at, we finally found one that had a house that that actually had very little lipstick in it, which was one of my preconditions because I didn't want to pay for lipstick on a pig. I just wanted to buy the pig. Um, but I wanted to buy a pig that basically could be retrofitted down the road to meet my uh, values and vision, my goal set, which was low energy consumption. And so I, it took me a long time to find that property that had all those characteristics. And ultimately, when I look at what we paid for that property and what we got for it, um, I feel like we got a really fair deal um, because we had a whole bunch of infrastructure that needed repairing, but that's okay. I'm, I'm capable of doing that. And then we got this incredible land base to go along with it that had all the other conditions that I was looking for. And so I don't think that if I bought that land bare and then had to go and replace that infrastructure, that I would have gotten the kind of price that I have right now. I would have probably had to spend a lot more money. And so generally speaking, uh, assets are worth a lot less like uh, physical assets, like buildings are worth a lot less than um, having to build them new. To give you a sense, uh, new construction right now is, is running between three and $400 a square foot. That's if somebody else is building it. So a thousand square foot house without buying the land is 300 grand at the lowest level. Um, it's really expensive to build. And then you've got all the building permits and all the other stuff that goes along with that. So yeah. there's something to think about. Yeah. Which is another point that the in terms of the building permits, Rob, which is that um, one of the benefits of like there's, these are all pros and cons. And but one of the one of the benefits is the, um, the, the land use bylaw or the building codes that Rob just mentioned are, are ridiculously strict compared to what they were, you know, 30, 40 years ago. And so, for example, like a septic field that used to cost, you know, five, six thousand dollars might now be like fifty thousand dollars depending on um, what county you live in and stuff like that. But if, if you have a $5,000 one that was built 30 years ago, it might last for another 30, 40 years and it'll get grandfathered in and you don't have to, you don't have to pay for any of that stuff. So um, really do your due diligence when you're buying a property, consider the pros and cons, consider what the, um, uh, you know, what the value is being attributed at and also through what the replacement costs of that same infrastructure, but also consider whether or not it has value to you. Like, you know, if, if there's a bunch of barns and buildings that you have no plans on using, they have no value to you. So um, one of the things we uh, we recommend is, is basically doing like a spreadsheet uh, system where you're, you're kind of doing like your needs and yields and uh, actually is, uh, attributing a financial capital cost associated to, to each of those things. And then you can start to rank different properties that you're looking at based on um, what the what the value is to you and the value that it's being charged um, uh, based on replacement costs and things like that. So you can start to get, get an, an idea for yourself. Is it better to buy uh, something that's built or build from scratch? Yeah, totally. Keep in mind too that once you have a process for design and for diagnosis, any property can be a permaculture property. Any like, yes, there are going to be type one errors that you're going to have to fix. Sometimes you can't get out of them, and so you're going to have to figure out how to navigate that. But um, the the goal of permaculture is to turn problems into solutions. And so um, one of the other things that we say is either change your visions and value or change your property. And so if you're really clear on what you want your property to have then it, it, you're gonna be like me. It's gonna be really difficult for you to find a property. It's gonna take a long time and a lot of searching. Mm -hmm. If you don't really care what your property has and you're willing to kind of roll with the punches, then as long as you have a process of diagnosing the property, you're gonna be able to look at what its inherent strengths are and you're going to be able to enhance those strengths using the ideas that we espouse in, uh, in the work that we do um, or in, in permaculture or whatever it is that you're following. But um, yeah. So the, just a couple other thoughts there, because I, I think this is this is a question that, that we actually get a lot, and so I'm sure there's a lot of other people that will um, that will get benefit from this as well. Is um, just so, something to consider is like if if you're a newbie and like you're you're moving from like an urban environment, you don't have a lot of background uh, and experiential capital and that kind of stuff. I would not recommend building from scratch the first time. There's just there's the learning curve is too steep. Um, and even if you even if you do have a reasonable amount of experience, if you've never actually developed an entire 
property or you don't know what all those aspects are, it's still probably better or safer to, to go with something that East has, has a little bit of infrastructure. And one of the reasons for that is um, the, there's just so many infinite, op like when you have bare land, <laughs> it's like you, you can do anything. And for a lot of people that is, um, uh, you kind of get uh, analysis paralysis with that. And then now there is, uh, there are ways that you can constrain those options down, but um, they take, for example, our place. Uh, we, I took my first PD permaculture design course in 2012 and uh, we had already built most of our infrastructure before we'd ever heard of permaculture, like our house, our, our shop, our corrals, most of our, our fencing and our flora systems were, were mostly established. Now, now we did rearrange them after the, the design course, but I can speak from ex in experiences is um, you, as Rob said, you can turn any property into a permaculture property with, um, with very little, uh, very, very little work. But what, what it comes down to is if you're going to buy a property that has buildings that have no value to you, don't like uh, one of the, <clears throat> there's, there's different resource classes you can think about. <clears throat> um, there's uh, uh, five of them. So the, the first one is, um, they're called regenerative resources. So these are things that get better with use. So livestock, plants, seeds, um, any kind of life, basically. The more you use it, as long as it's used properly, the more it gets, it actually increases in value. So there's regenerative resources, then there's sustainable resources. So these are resources that you can use almost indefinitely with no change. So things like sunlight, uh, water. Again, this is all dependent on, on um, uh, as long as they're used reasonably well. Um, then you've got uh, degenerative resources, which is basically anything humans build is a degenerative resource. As soon as you finish building a house, a car, a piece of equipment, a tool, as soon as it's done, it starts to break down. It starts to rust. It starts to wear and tear. It starts to rot. Uh, and at a certain point, it might be 10 years, it might be a thousand years, but at a certain point it will be consumed by the environment and go back. So these are degenerative resources. As they're used, they themselves break down. Um, now that being said, you can use degenerative resources regeneratively if you're using them properly. So example, you can, you can use a tractor or you can use a windbreak fence to establish trees that will supplant the function of that original resource that you were using. Um, there's also vulnerable resources, which these are resources that if you don't use them, they disappear. Again, things like genetics, seeds, information, skills. Uh, some, some skills, if you don't use them, they, the, like, you know, your, your muscles, if you, don't, if you don't move every day, those resources disappear. And then the fifth one is, um, these are destructive resources. So, as you use them, they destroy things like herbicides, uh, nuclear power, stuff like that. Um, they, um, uh, they actually take away as they're being used. So um, what I'm getting, what I was getting to with that, those different kinds of resource classes is that all buildings are degenerative resources. So th they, re they require input, your input to keep them and maintain them from, from going south. So, uh, most old farms and acreages had way too many buildings on them. And, uh, and so now you're in a position where you've got all this liability. Uh, like Rob and I have gone to properties where in, there's one in Saskatchewan, there was like, how many wells? There was three bore wells. Three wells. There's three, three wells on this property. The woman, she knew about one of them or something, maybe two. And they turned out to be like multi thousand dollar liabilities that she had legally had to fix. Um, otherwise she could be fined huge amounts of money. Um, I almost fell into one as we were <laughs> walking around the property. So you have to think about that too, is like, like they are, they can be positive or negative assets. If you've got an old trailer that has a, a septic system and everything, you, you gotta get rid of it now. You just inherited somebody's to-do list that was 30 years old. And now you gotta deal with that before you start doing any work for yourself. So again, this, these are just some of the pros and cons you can think about uh, with some of the stuff when you walk onto a property. And that's all part of the diagnosis. 
Totally. Why don't we, um, why don't we show people, I'll let you get that up and running, but um, what a, our diagnostic tool looks like. Um, this is an open source okay. tool that we've created and um, you can download it on the Verge Permaculture website. It lives within Google Earth Pro. And uh, while Dakota is just getting that ready, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to another question. Um, so the next question is, any recommendations on managing gray water systems in Ontario, especially cold winter weather? So first question you have to answer is, is it legal? Now, we were doing a project, Dakota and I, a couple of years ago, um, and I didn't get a really clear answer. It seemed to be that there was a possibility to do it, but a lot of times the gray water legislation that people are kind of looking at, or if it is legal, except for in BC, BC's got it right, British Columbia, um, they put it through these gray water processing units that sit in your basement and they filter and clean the gray water and then they chlorinate it and then they send it back up into the toilet. I think those are the worst possible systems you could ever invest in because, um, so let's just kind of back up a step here. The, um, the regulators are really concerned about people getting sick from wastewater, which is understandable, I get that. Um, however, uh, when you set up a proper gray water system like described in Brad Lancaster's books or in Art Ludwig's books, creating an oasis with gray water, uh, once the gray water leaves the house and goes into a mulch basin, it is nowhere, it's not available for any kind of contamination because solar radiation uh, is going to kill any of the pathogens that, that's in that water, anything that's left on the surface. So the, the health risk is really low. Um, and if they're properly designed, you're not going to get flooding and all of that other stuff. When you put one of these centralized treatment systems into your basement, now you're asking the homeowner to use chlorine, which is a toxic gas that was used to make mustard gas. You're asking them to change a filter um, that's collecting hair, skin cells, anything that's coming off of your body is gonna be collected in this basket filter. And then they gotta go in there and change the rotting stuff in that filter out. It's disgusting. And so you can imagine that filter is dark, it's damp, it's warm, it's a breeding ground for pathogens. And then if they forget to change the filter or they forget to change the chlorine, now they're pumping black water up into their toilet uh, to flush it. And so now you've got the aerosol um, of having this black water in the toilet going up into the environment. And so the number of pathogen vectors that you've got in a system like that are unacceptable. Um, so the first thing you need to do is look at the land use bylaw and understand what you're allowed to do within that framework. And then from there, you can make a judgment call with regards to whether it makes sense to use gray water um, or not. All right, so why don't you share your screen there, Dakota. And um, we get a lot of questions about looking at land and uh, helping people to buy the right piece of land. People don't usually end up um, hiring us to do it because um, it, it appears to be a large cost on the front end um, for us to get involved and, and help people to do this. Uh, type of work we do it occasionally but um and and one of the reasons to think about this is that when you buy land you usually pay a real estate agent and then you get to amortize his expense over 30 years when we ask to be hired um you have to amortize that in one day so or one hour or one second or whatever so um the reality is though is that when you buy the wrong piece of land for your values and vision you end up paying for it for the rest of your life so what we've created, um, uh, Dakota put together kind of uh, a list of all of the questions that we ask when we go and do consulting. And then he, con he consolidated it into this Google Earth tool, um, which is available on our website. And I'll put a link up to that once, uh, once he's got the tool shared there on where you can go and get that. And um, actually the first thing that we should show them is, uh, is the mapping tool. Um, oh, or I'll let you go with this with, with regards to what you're doing. We'll show the mapping tool and then we'll show how that integrates into Google Earth Pro. Totally. So I'm just, um, this is a, uh, this is essentially what the entire tool is built around. It's uh, something we call the uh, order of operations. <clears throat> it's based off of PA Yeoman's work um, around the idea that there are different factors uh, that make up your property and your resources. <clears throat> and uh, some of those factors are harder uh, and faster to, or harder and slower to change than others. So when we look at things like climate and geography, they're very difficult and slow to have any influence over. 
versus things like, you know, bringing in a livestock, starting a business, buying a piece of technology, um, things like that. Those happen a lot faster. Uh, but, but over the, the years of consulting work that we've done, these are, you know, the 11 or so factors that Rob and I use the most often. Now, what these exact factors are and what their order is will change based upon uh, your goals, your property contacts, things like that. Uh, for example, in, um, in uh, places like Australia, I would definitely put climate first, then geography. But here in, in uh, you know, central Alberta and Canada, I would put geography first. Climate changes much more readily than uh, geography does here. So I would put it below that, but um, uh, things like that. So this is essentially the, uh, uh, the layout of this particular program. And what, if, what it basically is, is a series of nested folders, just to clean it up here, that you can see where those uh, factors are just put into their little boxes that you store information in. And some of the information that you can store in them are things like climatic data uh, that you pull off the internet from readily available sources. So here are all of the climatic and temperature data uh, from my area. Here are all the solar patterns uh, from you know, the, the uh, angles of, of sunrise and sunset, the, the azimuth angles that can be factored in for, for various you know, shade calculations and, and building calculations. So you put all this kind of information in there and you can toggle it on and off almost as if it was like a, a, um, a vellum paper or a tracing paper that you put over a design uh, as opposed to that being, that's an analog way of, of stacking complexity into a design. This is a, a digital way that is, was for me, was life-changing when I started using this, this style of uh, program. So when it comes to geography, um, one of the most important aspects is uh, your contour maps. And we are going to, uh, I'm just going to pull up the contour maps for, uh, so this is a, another tool that myself and Rob and a uh, fellow by the name of Danilo from uh, um, Uruguay to help develop. It's a contour mapping tool. And you can essentially map any property in the world for, for, uh, for free, where you can actually see the image. And if you want to download that into Google Earth Pro, uh, you can pay uh, a small fee and they actually create a layer that you can bring right into Google Earth Pro. So I'm going to actually show, try to get to our place here. Is the internet okay, Rob? Yeah. The speed's okay. Okay, so I'm almost I'm almost at our farm here, and I'm actually going to turn on the satellite so we can see a little better here. So this is our farm, and uh, we have the ability to, as I said, oops, I forgot. You can uh, basically select, you know, any size property, and you can do a quarter section or uh, literally thousands of acres. And you can get a contour map, which shows you, you know, the red is the high elevation, the, the light blue is the lowest elevation. Um, and you can actually click on these and they'll tell you what the elevation number is. So, you know, for example, on our property, you know, the high point is, you know, 810 and the low point at our house here is you know, 777. And um, that was super useful in us, doing calculations for our dams, our gravity water systems, uh, things like that. And so you can get this all for free if you want to download it and have it br brought into Google Earth Pro as a layer. Uh, you can just go to the sign me up button here. And essentially what it does is it brings it into Google Earth Pro. And I'm just gonna turn this on now. Um, and this is what it looks like. So now it's a layer. This is, this is a bigger map that I did earlier. Now this is a layer that I can toggle on and off inside Google Earth Pro. And you can see how closely the contour lines follow up to, this is a swale that was built on our property. 
uh, I believe back in 2014, it was one of the first whales. You can actually see how closely it follows the, the contour lines. They're not perfect because the, the data that we're using is just open source data. But for example, like this map costs, it's free. You can take a screenshot of it and bring it in if you want, uh, or you can pay 20 bucks and it does it automatically. But this contour map cost me $1,500. This is a LIDAR contour map that I had to I had to pay for from a, a different company and they're not available everywhere in the world. So <clears throat> um, that just gives you some ideas. But then when you get down into, uh, after you do all your diagnosis stuff, we have a, um, a folder for design and, uh, oops, that's too many layers. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna toggle on my water design and you can see how, how much information you can stack into this and you can use the contour lines to figure out you know, where your swales might go, where your dams might go. You can store information like text-based information inside of the folders. You can, you can even add in imagery. So this is um, one of the uh, amazing things I, I love about this, this program is like I can have, turn some of this stuff off here. You can stack in uh, before and after photos as part of your layers, uh, just by having different different uh, layering systems. So, you know, this is what our property used to look like before we got it into permaculture. This is what it looks like now. Um, this is a, uh, these are some of the soil tests that we do on our property uh, that show, you know, the various NP and K and, and micronutrient levels. You can store all this stuff in, in a free program. Like everything I just showed you, you can get for free. If you um, basically sign up for the contour map, uh, you'll get put into a, a download link that, that will give you access to this download. It's just a, a template that fits into Google Earth Pro, which is a open source uh, software now. And um, oh, I, this is a, another great part is you can take photos and embed those into it as well. So this is, you know, some of the water harvesting earthworks on our place and showing, you know, some of the before and after pictures during our cropping cycles. Uh, this is actually a drought year. You can see, um, here's all the water that we stored and it was one of the worst droughts in 30 years. And you can see how much greener the, the grass is beneath the swale there. So <clears throat> those are just some of the things that you can do with, with that, uh, that program. I've got a, another a comp question and then a comment here. That was great. Thanks, Dakota. Um, and I put those links up into the chat window for folks that want to follow through with that. Uh, D40I says, Rob, about the gray water system, it's more along the line of under the radar plant based gray water filtration, dishwater and shower only. So, yeah, and, and then you mentioned that, yeah, the health risk is really low. Um, and so, Brad's got some really great um, low tech systems for harvesting gray water that um, would technically not be illegal. And so when you understand how the code works, when gray water, so when you're having a bath, for example, you don't bathe in gray water, you bathe in water and you clean yourself. And so at some point when the bureaucrats get involved, they have to make a distinction with regards to when it turns from being bathing water into, into when it turns into being black water. And, the, and most of these provincial codes don't actually have a designation for gray water, which means that it doesn't exist in the universe. It's not, it's not something that humans know what, what, what it is. It's just a made up word. And so what happens is the pipes in your house, and I know this because I, I got in trouble for harvesting gray water in my backyard. Um, and I, I would go through all these things. I'm not doing it right now. Um, but when I was doing it, I got a cease and desist order because I was talking about it like I am with you right now. And so the minute that that water in my bathtub ended up uh, touching the black pipe, because all of the plumbing pipe on our baths and our showers and our sinks are black, it instantly transmutates into black water, instantly. There's a magical force that gets um, imbued into the water to make it black. And so by connecting a valve into that black pipe, I was... Um, tampering, even though it was in my house, because of the way that our building permits work, that pipe no longer belongs to you, it belongs to the city. And so by doing that, I was tampering with city of Calgary property, which is what got me in trouble. Um, and so the way to harvest it is to wash your dishes in a Rubbermaid container and then carry it outside, or to put a siphon pump next to your bathtub 
and make sure you've got a window right by it and siphon the water into your garden um, because you're not actually tampering with the city's property. Um, now, I might get in trouble for saying that, but um, that has been some of the strategies in the states where gray water hasn't been legal and they don't want to um, uh, have an issue with that. Or an another really simple strategy I've seen, um, uh, I think this is in Australia where they were in like extreme drought conditions. They, um, people would shower, but they would shower while standing inside of like a large container, like a Rubbermaid container. So all the water would, that they would you know, bathe themselves with would, would go off into this container. And then again, you can carry it out. Uh, which is even simpler than the, the siphoning system. Rob, could you um, uh, could you throw the links up for those incredible uh, videos you did of Brad Lancaster's property? In oh yeah, totally. uh, We we were down in uh, in the states. Was it not this winter, but last winter um, on a sailing trip? We came back up through the states, and uh, we managed to stop in at Brad's place. And I think there's like four or five videos we did there that are just fantastic that show all the different systems that Brad has of his property. It's just, it's incredible. <clears throat> uh, while yeah, you're doing, pretty amazing. While you're doing that, Rob, I've got a couple of questions that came to me via email. Uh, so sure. one of them, I'm actually, I'm gonna, I'll come back to this while, you, while you're doing that. The second question is how do you make compost tea and how do you use it? Uh, this on your farm and gardens, when do you use this? So um, there's, Compost teas and there's compost extra extracts. Uh, compost extracts are essentially you taking compost, putting it in water, mixing it up immediately, and then using it like within you know a day or so. Um, a compost tea is something just like when you make tea, you're brewing it. You you let it sit for a while, um, and the compost teas require uh, because. The, the kinds of microorganisms you're trying to um, encourage in your soil are, are aerobic. As soon as you put them into water and you let them sit, they start to die because they can't get any oxygen. So you have to oxygenate them, which requires a lot of uh, pumps, which Rob has some videos, I believe, on his YouTube channel. Uh, really simple DIY, like five gallon bucket pumps and things like that. You can buy commercial compost tea extract systems that use, or compost tea brewing systems that use those uh, IBC totes, the international bulk container totes, those uh, uh, white plastic cubes. You can turn one of those into a compost uh, tea system and there's like huge pumps that, that blow oxygen into the water and you can brew them for, for you know, hours or days and adding different things into it. Um, so that's how, you, that's how you do it and how you make compost tea and the difference between those two. When it comes to how you use them on your farm and gardens, I don't <laughs> uh, because I am incredibly lazy. Um, now this is just my, this is my, uh, me speaking from my experience here. That's actually not true. I, I have made compost brew or uh, compost extracts because that's, that's pretty simple. Or you just, you chuck compost in water, you mix it up, and I just grab like a, a paintbrush or some grass or something like that. And I just dip it in and just throw it out on top of my garden. I've done that. I've never really seen any benefit from it um, that I can speak to. But I have taken, you know, soil uh, health courses from uh, Dr. Lane Ingham, from Nicole Masters, from Jay Fuhr, uh, from guys like... Um, uh, Ray Archuleta, like I've, I've done my homework on soil health stuff. And um, yeah, I also Jeff Lawton, he's a, he's a huge fan of compost and, um, and all those things. For me, it's just, it's too, it's too technical. Uh, and it's, it's, I, I don't get the benefit. That being said, we have really good soils where we live. Like, I don't know if, if you watch some of my YouTube videos and you can see some of the swale excavations, like it's like black, black as black soil for you know two to three feet so that might be why it doesn't make any i don't see any benefit from it where if you got terrible soil you might see uh, a return on it so don't don't take my advice for it and i have heard incredible testimonies of people restoring terrible soil but uh that being said i've also heard incredible stories of people healing so healing their soils regenerating their soils without using compost tea and using things like cover cropping which is something that we do use and I have had an incredible amount of success with and I'm a much bigger fan of myself. Um, 
coming back to uh, how to use it on your farms and gardens. So again, you can you can put it into applicators, but again, all that stuff is like the you get into situations where you get biofilm. So anytime compost tea sits inside of any kind of a tube or a pipe or a bucket, it creates a biofilm that becomes anaerobic that that works against you. And so you have to constantly sterilize and clean your equipment. Otherwise you get bad bacteria or, or negative uh, organisms in your compost teas. And so like for me, the 80-20 is like, I would never do a compost tea. This is just for myself. I would make a brew. I would take soil uh, or sorry, um, healthy compost, mix it in water and immediately apply that. And I would just use like a, a, a bucket I could clean out easily afterwards and some grass that I could throw away. Um, and when you use them in the, um, think about it this way is one of the other reasons why I don't like compost tea is it becomes another input. And so it's, it's no different if uh, it can be used as an input, just like fossil uh, fuel fertilizers or synthetic herbicides or things like that. Um, if it's, if you have to, constantly put it on what's the point in that and so um i think they make sense to use them as inoculants to get systems going but if you're constantly applying it, it to me th there's something else wrong in your system that that needs to be addressed so um f f what, what you want to think about is is if you if you're applying organisms to to your soil that's all it is compost is is just uh microbiology that are beneficial organisms that are going to help the nutrient exchange with your plants. So think about what's the best time that I can apply those organisms so that they are going to survive and thrive and reproduce in the soil so that I don't have to do this anymore. So what are the conditions that they like? Well, they like cool, uh, moist um, soils. They need food, they need oxygen. So for me, like if I, if I was going to apply them, um, I would do it in the evening, just as the sun's going down. And tip, ideally, I would do it just before or, or just after a rain, um, you know, early in the year, so that's it's not hot. Because if you if you're just going to throw compost out there, and the next day it's going to be 30 degrees uh, Celsius, and it's going to burn them all off, you just wasted your time. Um, so those are some things to. Again, this is my perspective. I could be totally wrong about this, but from from my experience, it hasn't been all that incredibly useful. And I think, but even, even if it was useful, there are better ways to do it than the compost tea systems. Um, Rob, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I share the same agreement. I think that they're really great for kickstarting. Um, I think you're gonna see the biggest change in the most degraded soils. Um, and uh, I would recommend if you're interested in this subject, go check out Christine Jones's website, Amazing Carbon. Um, I can uh, look that up for you and put it up into the chat here in a second. So I'm going to change subjects here, if that's okay. Yeah, go for it. So uh, Samit, how are you doing, Samit? It's been a while since you've been in Calgary. I hope you're doing well out in Ontario. Your question was, how much more detailed was the LiDAR versus open source contour map? It looks like open source is one meter. So I think, what first of all, and I know you know this because you're hyper intelligent, but um, there's a difference between accuracy and precision. Um, and so, um, I will say that the contour map, one of the reasons that you can go play around with it for free is that not all the places on the earth have great data. And so you kind of have to, to vet it before you go and buy it. Um, we have a that's new cool. data set that's going to be uploaded here in the next month or so, um, with a new tool that we're in the process of building right now. And that looks like it's going to be a lot more, um, accurate. And so even though it's one meter, which is a fairly precise range for an, a rural property, um, the accuracy still needs to be vetted or um, field tested uh, to make sure that it, it makes sense. Because we've definitely downloaded maps in certain areas of, of the world where we've been doing uh, consultancy and we haven't been super happy with the results. So make sure you vet it before you buy it. But, but that being said, some places, the data is just as good as the, as the really expensive stuff. Right? So there's, cause we are, we're essentially taking open source data um, that is just noise to most people. And, and with our uh, software developer, we're turning those into usable maps with whatever's available. And 
as the data sets get better, our program is gonna get better as well as, as Rob's alluding to. But right now they do have value. And, and particularly they are very useful uh, when you're trying to buy a property and you're just trying to get like the broad brushstrokes and figure out, you know, where are the major valleys or another way to look at it is like, if you're trying to map out an entire watershed, you know, you can, you can access data in several other ways, but a lot of them are very cost prohibitive if you're doing it in a big area. Whereas with these free country maps, you can map all of Canada if you want, if you have a computer strong enough to handle it. I, I haven't, the biggest I've done is like a county uh, which is like tens of thousands of acres, but uh, you, you can pull all that stuff in. And it's, that's very accurate. It's not very precise, but it tells you like where it shows there's a valley, there's a, there's a stream there. Um, so again, it, it all depends on what you're trying to do and also where you, you live, which is like Rob said, why we have the preview option. You can try before you buy. And, and even if you know how to use Google Earth Pro, you can take a screenshot of that and you can print it off or you can import it into Google Earth Pro if you if you if you don't have the twenty bucks uh, to to buy that. We there's you won't be doing us any harm. But if, if you want something that is is uh, perfectly geo rectified, that is tr transparent, that has all the layers on it um, for twenty bucks, it's uh, it's super valuable. And and I use both of them, both the the paid version of the the lidar mapping and the the larger data set from a bigger area. Uh, uh, for different situations. <clears throat> awesome. Okay, next question is from Al Daoust. Nice to see you, Al. Um, there's a bunch of people here that I recognize. Uh, Kathy, nice to see you on the, on the chat this evening. Um, any best practices for new driveway installation on new land? So Al, um, and I know you're developing a piece of property with some wet spots, I think, because uh, you've asked that question in the past. Um, so all I can do is tell you some of the the mistakes that we've seen over the years um, and some of the things that we recommend. So generally um, access is best on areas where there's not a lot of water. So ridge lines generally, we generally recommend that they are as short as possible because you don't want to, especially in these Northern climates, long roads are expensive to maintain, they're expensive to build. Um, and so shorter is better. Um, some of the mistakes that we've seen are people that want to uh, put their prop, um, their main site as far away from the access road as possible um, in order to kind of get away and have privacy only to find out that the road is a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars to build um, and that's just the beginning because then you've got uh, the maintenance and you've got to buy the machines to maintain it and you've got to buy the gravel and uh, it just doesn't end so um, always try and choose the driest path and so this is another great reason why you want a contour map contour map so here's Here's probably one of my biggest insights over the last decade. Everything on a, on a property either wants water or doesn't want water. And so because of that simple fact, um, you can pretty much place everything on your property just by knowing where the water is going and where it's, where it's coming from, where it's going and, and how it traverses the property. The other interesting insight that I've had is that everything is either a dehydration element or a rehydration element. So roads are dehydration elements. They should be built like roofs. They should shed water. And so um, roads should be always um, placed in dry places, knowing that they're gonna harvest water. And then adjacent to those roads, we should harmonize those roads with water harvesting elements so that we can take advantage of the surfaces to rehydrate the landscape and do more things for us. So grow shelter belts grow berry hedges, uh, send water to ponds to, so that they have more catchment to fill them up, those sorts of things. So those are some basic ideas that you can think about when you're building a road. Dakota, do you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, I'm actually gonna share my, my screen here and uh, just show some examples of, of our place here. So uh, this is one of our, uh, our, our, our main driveway here on the property. And uh, you can see it, it actually serves as a, like Rob has said, it's, it's a water harvesting device in several ways. One is that it actually, you know, crosses a valley and kind of shuttles water down towards our pond uh, during spring melts and stuff. But um, the, another thing about a road is through the needs and yields uh, analysis. So what does a road need? 
while a road needs, like Rob said, it needs to be in a dry place. It needs gravel. It needs clay to be built. Um, and what does it yield? Well, it's a compacted surface that yields water. Uh, it's, they're typically hot, um, so, you know, th things like that. But just from the, those two there, like it, they need clay to be built um, up before you put down your, your gravel, ideally, uh, unless you've got solid gravel or you can, uh, you're in a place like that. But in, in our climate, uh, you need to have clay. You can't build it on top of black dirt. You need some kind of a, a base to put it on unless you're going to use expensive, uh, um, what are they called? Geofabrics or whatever. But um, so for this little example here, uh, the, this pond that you can see, we built that pond. Um, and we also actually, we first, we built our, our house here and we used the material from the house, from the basement as the clay to build our road. So we basically had, you know, an excavator in with a dump truck and he drove right up here, got filled up and then just drove down the driveway to build it up that way. Um, so that's one way you can access clay is if you're building a basement. Another way is if you're building a pond, because again, that's something that, that yields clay and the road needs it. And if you put those things side by side, we actually had an excavator come in and build the second leg of this road later on. And he literally could just go back and forth on this road here reaching into this pond, pulling out the clay. First, he stripped off the black dirt and set it aside, obviously. Then he piled the black or clay on the road here and track rolled it back and forth to compact it. And we got two uh, elements with one action. But the other thing that happens because they're built side by side is that now when it rains, this entire road funnels down into this pond. And so it actually fills it um, all through design, same thing over here. So in most years, just the runoff from our driveways here and the way that we've graded them and designed them, they keep this pond full year round, which is an essential part of our integrated livestock system because it grows duckweed. So this is not algae that's growing on this pond. It's actually a plant called duckweed or lemna minor or uh, water lentil is another name for it, which is an incredible livestock feed. Uh, it's like 40% protein. So uh, those are just some things to think about is in terms of the, the needs and yields of your, your elements and how to stack functions in there. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Um, okay. So next, next one is, uh, would you suggest, uh, what would you suggest as an alternative to patio pavers or concrete for pathways on an urban lot? So in my garden, we just, uh, we use swales, we use ditches on contour and we fill them up with wood mulch and I love it great i love walking on wood mulch when i'm in the garden it's nice and soft on the feet um it uh creates fungal soil conditions for um for our gardens which is great except for the brassicas they're the ones that don't like the, the fungal soil conditions but it doesn't seem to affect them too much not yet anyways um so i really like that um and uh we use the same thing for our our food forest um, and then any paths that are kind of getting access to the food forest or around the house are all in concrete and they seem to work pretty well. If you're going to pour concrete, just like Dakota showed with his roads, though, um, you can slope that concrete. You can design that concrete so that it becomes a water harvesting uh, feature that enhances the um, hydration of the, um, of the thing that's adjacent to it, the garden or the food forest. Okay, next question comes in from um, I'm not sure Monica if you're asking this about rain tanks or if you're asking this about aquaponics. Um, so is it necessary to cover IBC totes to exclude light so as not to have an algae bloom? So I'm going to speak to the rainwater piece. Um, no, actually. Uh, the only reason to cover an IBC tote is because they're probably not UV stable the plastic and so that water is going to potentially be contaminated by any kind of UV degradation. Um, if you're buying polyethylene tanks which tend to be black or it's a different type of plastic they are UV stable they will form a biofilm and or a um, layer on the inside regardless of whether there's sun it might just change the type of microbes that are present. That biofilm is your best friend it actually um, is going to bioaccumulate toxins that are in the rainwater. And um, there's a ton of research that you can read from Dr. Peter Coombs, his website, Urban Water Cycles. I can look it up um, 
when Dakota's talking next and put it up there. And so some of the findings from that research was that the biofilms that were forming on the sides of tanks, when they compared um, the composition of those biofilms to the center center water column in the tank had upwards of a 300,000 time concentration of lead in the biofilm when compared to the center center water column in the water. So um, what that means is that the, the tank is actually an ecosystem and the microbes are cleaning the water as, um, as it stays stationary in that tank. Um, so just some interesting things there. I'll find that research and throw it up into the chat. And just a, a shout out to everybody. Um, we're kind of at the midpoint here of tonight's show. If you're getting value out of tonight's show, give us a like. It helps the channel to spread um, to more people. Uh, YouTube will put it, push it out a little bit more. And um, by all means, feel free to uh, share this video on your social media channels. Um, let's get a few more people onto the talk tonight. We've been hovering around 60 all night, uh, which is awesome. Uh, but like the, the chat says, we'll answer any question that you've got on anything that uh, is related to permaculture, regenerative agriculture, farming, food production, passive solar, everything, uh, renewable energy, you name it. Okay, next question. Um, let's see here. Pascal uh, Provost, uh, we're taking down a large silver maple to gain sunlight. Apart from mulch, hookah culture, mushroom logs, any ideas on how else we can recycle it? So I'll just answer this and I'm sure Dakota will have a couple of other things to say. I'm just hiring, I just found a, a local um, sawyer that I'm gonna hire for 75 bucks an hour. He's gonna come in and he's gonna, he's gonna mill all the, the logs that I'm cutting down for the exact same reason. And I'm gonna produce really high value cants, so big chunks of wood. Uh, and I'm going to start saving them up over the next three years so that when I'm ready to build another structure, I've got these beautiful logs that I can use to, uh, to build those, those structures. And so look for a local portable sawmill that, that can come and help you turn that into slabs or something else. Yeah, I mean, the, the only other thing I can think of is, uh, is firewood, uh, which might seem you know, like, a, like a terrible thing to, to waste, but maple is, it makes fantastic fuel. And if you have a wood stove uh, in your place, or if you think about getting a wood stove for uh, a little bit of energy resiliency, uh, you know, a large maple tree could provide you with months of, of heat and cooking energy um, right through the wintertime, which also you, then you can turn the wood ash into fertilizer to put back on your gardens and uh, different things like that. So uh, I think those are all good options that you just mentioned, as well as the, the two that Rob and I threw out there. Uh, I can't really, I can't think of anything else. E even if you don't like, if you don't need the, the lumber um, in, uh, in one of our local cities here, there's uh, an operation, I can't remember what the name of it is, but uh, there's a guy who'll come and cut your log. Like he, he, he basically reclaims uh, urban uh, trees and uh, if you donate the tree, then he'll come, come and cut it down for free and uh, turn it into lumber and then sell it to other people, if, even if you don't want the lumber. So that could be another option as well if there's one of those outfits in the area. Yeah. So um, another comment here from Kathy. So the green scum inside the IBC is good. It's a living system. And uh, if you've got an opaque tank, you just can't see what's growing in there. So uh, it's not necessarily bad, that's for sure. There's no data to support that translucent tanks are worse than um, opaque ones. Um, okay, Rory uh, McInerney, in your online PDC, will we be doing a design build project and held accountable to do it? So Rory, um, we're all adults here and I'm not gonna hold you accountable to do anything. Um, this is something that I've said right from the beginning of teaching, this is adult ed. And uh, what I will say though, is that you're gonna be with a whole bunch of students and you're gonna want to show progress to them because uh, they're gonna learn from what you do and you're gonna learn from what they do. So your students, your fellow students are gonna hold you accountable. The project that you have to do uh, as part of the permaculture design course to get your certificate is you need to do a design and you gotta submit that. Everybody in the program is gonna do a design and then we're gonna, we're gonna mark them. And we're going to be really excited to see them because the designs are always uh, the best part of the program. So um, we will have a TA. We've got six teachers and we're going to 
holds you accountable by inspiring you. And, and your fellow students are gonna hold each other accountable as well. Um, okay, uh, D40I, how many native species of fruit and nut trees do you have on your property, Dakota? Uh, native, there would be, uh, so like the, the biggest ones are uh, things like buffalo berry, Saskatoon, uh, red currant, black currant, um, you know, gooseberries. Uh, so that it, it's kind of a tricky question because there's there's like native wild species and then there's like native cultivar like species that you can find native that we've got cultivars for. So um, if you if you just want to talk about like just the native ones that aren't cultivars or improved varieties, then there's very few. It's like there's I mean, that we use uh, extensively in terms of fruit. Um, there's like Saskatoons and choke cherries, and um, um, that's about it. Those are the only two that, that I can think of. Now, uh, there are, as I mentioned, like the currants, the jostaberries, the hazelnuts, um, things like that. Those are all wild species that you can find on our property that we've brought in cultivars um, to um, that are more productive or taste better or um, have less disease issues and things like that. And in, in that case, like there's I don't know, 20 or 30 uh, different ones that we've got on our place. But it's a, it's a really good question because that the, um, so I don't get hung up too much on the native versus non-native conversation, because if you go back long enough in like, like what timeline are you talking about? Um, and uh, there's the, um, uh, you know, excellent uh, examples in, in you know, historical ecological books talking about how, you know, native species change by hundreds, if not thousands of, of miles uh, over the course of a few decades, just based on climatic patterns. So um, what I focus more on is uh, a species adaptability to a proper, to a, a site, which in that case, native species are your number one go-to because they're the most adapted to your, to your climate. <laughs> um, but that being said, I, I, I don't get too stuck up on the native versus non-native uh, conversation. And if folks want to go down the rabbit hole of invasive uh, species, Rob and I would both love to answer that question, but I will leave that as a, uh, a cue, because <laughs> that'll probably take the rest of the call. <laughs> totally. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I posted the research on biofilms in the chat window, guys, if you want to take a peek at that um, and uh, eat your heart out there. There's the 100 page thesis written by a guy named Dr. Anthony Spinks, who worked under um, Dr. Peter Coombs. Um, you can also find um, a whole bunch of other research papers that are relying or um, um, that uh, that give all sorts of information on rainwater. Um, Fish Gaming is writing uh, Guten a hundred times. Um, I'm assuming that's German for good. I'm glad that you like it. It's great. Perfect. Um, okay. So Big Rock Candy Mountain asks, do you work through earth and dam design in your program? Absolutely. Yep, that's uh, the water section and both Dakota and I teach water in the permaculture design course. So uh, I start kind of at a principles level and talk about all different water harvesting elements, um, as well as some some uh, ponds. And then uh, we actually have a um, uh, that was really inappropriate fish gaming, by the way, I'm not going to post that comment. Um, we don't post that sort of stuff here. So you can keep those ideas to yourself. <laughs> Anyhow, um, yes, pond, pond creation is part of the program. We have a grant funding agency that has sponsored a, an earthworks program. And so Verge Permaculture grads uh, are one of the first people to get notified of that, as well as people on Dakota Cohen's mailing list at cohenfarm.ca. I put a link to his website in the show notes below. Um, and I'll put his, his website up into the chat window as well. Um, and so the, uh, 
that that's a, a core piece of what we teach absolutely and then when we get into the more advanced permaculture courses the uh, building your permaculture property formerly called uh, building your adaptive habitat um, we go into a lot of detail on where ponds get placed and and um, resources on how to build them so i'll just put dakota's uh, website up here i don't know if you have anything to that dakota yeah i mean the uh, just adding to rob's stuff we will cover a lot of that stuff um giving examples and things and there's also like there's loads of q a like for every two hours of teaching there's an like an hour of of q a afterwards um for this course so there'll be lots of time for um the students to ask specific type questions relating to the content that we can get into more detailed stuff but um they're uh, a lot of the times, like before you figure out how to build a dam, you need to figure out first off, do you need a dam? And then where would you put it? And then you would figure out how you would build a dam. Because how to build a dam is actually really easy. Like there's uh, both Rob and I could get, like, if you just Google small farm dam uh, PDF or uh, quality farm dugouts or things like that, those are all excellent resources that tell you step by step how to build a dam. That's not the problem. The problem is, First off, do you need it? Um, uh, where do you put it? And how do you how do you design the dam to stack as many functions into it? That's the stuff you can't read anywhere in any book because um, the answer is it depends. And what it depends upon is all of the principles and uh, thought tools that uh, come out of permaculture design. And that's that's definitely what the, the course will focus on, but we can absolutely give specific examples um, for your property if you provide us with enough details. Okay. Um, so next um, question. Uh, Montana Tin Box Living. Looking for technical resources for gap design and passive solar sizing matchup. Any good resources? Let me tell you. <laughs> uh, okay. So there's a couple of things to that question. So I actually built a tool um, and we're just transferring all that to our website right now. Uh, for designing all of the components of a passive solar greenhouse. So if you're on my newsletter, you'll get access to that when it's available. Um, the thing with GAT, okay, GATs are basically geo air heat transfer systems. And that an acronym was made by a company in the US called Ceres. And the concept for that came from a guy named Jerome Ossentowski from the Rocky Mountain Permaculture Institute. And that concept from the Rocky Mountain Permaculture Institute came from another guy uh, and I can't remember his name right now, who was working with Jerome. And so the idea is that people take air from uh, a greenhouse and they pump it underground um, and then they exchange the heat out of it and they store it in the soil. And then the air comes out dehumidified and cooler during the day. And then at night, they turn the fan back on, they extract the heat from the earth and they pump that air into the, the greenhouse. So anecdotally, we know that it works. Uh, we've got a greenhouse here in Calgary. I just got an email from Vaden who runs uh, the greenhouse at Hull Services. And he said, in spite of the minus 40 temperatures we had for two weeks here, the greenhouse never went below zero degrees Celsius without any additional um, thermal energy. So to me, that's just incredible. Um, and so I'm always really cautious about these silver bullets. Um, and so I ended up designing a tool for people to calculate how to put them in and increase their chances of success because people are insistent on putting these things in. And sure enough, Vaden's system seems to be working. Now, what I will tell you is I'll save you a whole pile of money because I can guarantee that if you do one thing without doing that gap thing, that this will absolutely pay for itself. Um, the thermal curtain is inexpensive, easy to install, and it guarantees that you will save 50% of the heat loss out of your greenhouse when the sun goes down at night. And so all you have to do in your greenhouse is put a couple of airplane cables across, um, get yourself an insulated tarp, put it on, on uh, pulleys. And at nighttime, when the sun goes down, you just pull the tarp over. So poly um, plastic, like greenhouse plastic, has an R value of about one. Polycarbonate, which is the same material as on your headlamp on your light, comes in multiple layers, has an R value of about two, and is way more expensive, but it lasts longer. And an insulated tarp has an R value of about two or three. And so most of the heat loss in your greenhouse is gonna come out of that glazing at nighttime. It's gonna allow all the energy in during the day. And so we want it to allow energy in during the day. 
And then when the night comes, we want it to not let energy out. So we pull a thermal curtain over, and now you've just cut the heat loss of that greenhouse by 50% for a fraction of the cost of putting in a GOT system. We are actively doing research on these things, and um, I, I will release that research once I have completed it um, to determine what the best, absolute best practices are and how to guarantee uh, chances of success as well as when they don't make sense. So keep an eye on our newsletter and on our website, and uh, you'll get access to those tools when they're available. Rob, can you um, can you put some of the uh, case studies that you have from a couple of the greenhouses that you've built that have some of those systems, and also the uh, you've done some other work that um, the house, the mobile home that was cycling heat from the attic and pumping it underground. I think those yep. are other those are other two great uh, videos that you've put out. And uh, while you're while you're looking for those, I can um, I've got a couple of questions here that I can sure can go through. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so uh, one of the questions I've got is uh, we have four ducks and a lot of duck manure. Do you have any suggestions on using this on gardens? It's more alkaline than chicken compost. I've been told we can spread this directly on our gardens. Any suggestions? So <clears throat> The uh, I we've had ducks uh, for a couple of years at our place. I don't know a lot about them. I, I didn't know that their manure was less alkaline. Um, but my uh, my from my understanding, the reason why you couldn't put chicken manure on your garden is because it was too high in nitrogen, which I guess is kind of acidic. But so <clears throat> uh, basically, what I'm getting at is. Uh, I believe this is a nitrogen problem, not an alkaline or acidic problem. And the way you fix a nitrogen problem is with carbon. And so if you just put more straw down or wood chips or some kind of a carbon-based material in your duck house to absorb the uh, duck manure, um, and there's a really simple metric for this, which is go into your duck house or your chicken house and take a deep breath. <laughs> like really deep, re deep into the bottom of your lungs. And if you cough or if you want to vomit after that, you haven't put down enough carbonaceous material. So you need, you need to put, because what you're, what you're inhaling into your lungs is basically anhydrous ammonia and it's burning your lungs. There's actually, uh, there was a story last year that came out one of our local agricultural newspapers of a farmer who just about died while he was cleaning out his chicken house uh, because the anhydrous ammonia was so strong, it made him pass out. But Luckily, he called his wife right before because he felt a little woozy and uh, passed out while he was on the phone and she came and drug him out. Um, so uh, what I would do is, is whether you have chickens or ducks, just make sure you're adding more uh, straw, wood chips, things like that, than, than you th even more than you think you need. Use your nose as the testing mechanism because that's all fertility you're losing and hydrous ammonia um is uh, or not I just, just um, ammonia is um uh if you can smell it you're losing fertility so you don't want to do that and if you can't smell it you can you should be able to apply it directly regardless whether it's chicken or um or duck uh, manure or compost that being said uh i typically put my compost on in the fall just or my, my compost or manure on in the fall, just so it has a, uh, basically six months, um, again, depending on what climate you're in, uh, but it has basically a, grow, a half a year to go through and decompose and, and kind of settle down. Also, if there's any pathogens or anything like that in the manure, it will, uh, it will break down and generally not burn plants. Because you can get problems, things like potatoes, if you put on too much nitrogen, you can get uh, like scab, that can grow on your potatoes. Um, you can also get weed problems. Uh, a lot of weed seeds germinate when there's too much nitrogen. So things like thistles or um, pigweed, uh, which is a, I believe it's in the same family as like amaranth and quinoa. Um, I, I don't know what the Latin name is, but we call it pigweed here. Uh, but it like, it only grows in like high nitrogen environments. And so uh, if you put it on in the fall and give it a time to settle down, you're gonna have less weeds the following year in your garden than uh, if you put it on right away and try to grow in that. So uh, those are uh, those are some suggestions about, um, so yeah, apply it in the fall. Uh, and ideally you would actually apply it uh, with a cover crop. 
so that like you you so you take your garden off in like September, you know, uh, and this is in uh, Alberta type climate. If uh, uh, you harvest all your garden out, you could throw some compost on your garden or just raw chicken manure and then seed some cover crop seeds like rye or something into it that will grow in the last part of the season. And they'll absorb that because they're an annual, they'll absorb all that nutrients. Um, uh, they'll add carbon themselves into the soil. And then next spring, they'll, they'll grow right up until the frost. They'll grow first thing when the snow's off the ground and uh, you, can, you can till it in or mulch it out before your next growing season starts. And uh, you have, because one, one of the core tenets of a healthy soil is maintaining a living root in the ground as long as possible because that is the ultimate way to improve soil health for free is if there's a living root in the ground or a living plant, it's taking solar energy, um, combining that with carbon and water and it's turning into sugars that it's dumping into the ground. <clears throat> awesome. Um, okay, so I just wanted to mention one more thing about greenhouses. So in the permaculture design course that we're gonna be teaching, uh, we will briefly talk, talk about the greenhouse stuff. Um, we're also going to be offering um, a really cost-effective upgrade for our PDC students. If you want to take our full advanced permaculture, sorry, our advanced greenhouse design course, so that's going to be part of the program, um, as well as the rainwater harvesting program as well, just FYI. So that's going to be coming out news on that. Um, Rob, yeah. Rob, can you um, can you throw the link up to the the PDC page that has all the details? Because there's there's tons of if folks haven't seen that yet. There's uh, so there's um, the uh, Rob and Michelle from from Verge are are putting on their first online permaculture design course. Uh, we've already got over a hundred people registered in it, and uh, we think we might be able to go up to to two hundred, which is fantastic. And there's I believe there's like eight or nine different teachers, a bunch of uh, uh, learning assistants that are going to be there one on one or not one on one, um, but to help with one on one questions. With, uh, with people virtually. The whole thing is gonna be delivered live with the recordings available afterwards. And um, you can basically take a world-class PDC that Rob and Michelle have been teaching for, for more than a decade now from the comfort of your home and have lifetime access to it. But there's a ton of other stuff that they're adding into it. Um, I'll be one of the, the guest teachers for the program doing about 20 or 30 hours of, of content for the course. And uh, it's going to be fantastic. It's taking place over the next 10 weeks. It starts uh, this Sunday, April 19th. So if you guys are interested in that, it's, uh, it's one of the cheapest PDCs uh, I've ever seen advertised and uh, probably has the most value of, of any PDC that I've ever seen. It's going to be absolutely amazing. And I think it's the first, one of the first uh, online PDCs that's, that's actually live. Like the whole thing is live. It's not just you get recordings and you get to ask Q&A remotely. It's, it's not like you're on a call just like this and we're giving presentations. You can ask questions as you're, as the content is coming out. And then there'll be also live Q&A. Uh, it's like one hour of, of Q&A for every two hours of, of content. So it's, it's a, a really interactive program, even though it's, it's happening remotely. Uh, thanks, Dakota. We're really, really stoked to be offering this. Um, we've been kind of on the fence about offering an online course for a long time. Um, but uh, I don't know about you, but I was just getting so many phone calls from people uh, yeah. wanting to kind of take action. And, uh, and a few people have mentioned that they finished Netflix. And so they're looking for another <laughs> source of entertainment. So anyhow, um, uh, yeah, if you're interested in learning more about that, I put the link in the in the uh, chat there. You can reach out and email us if you have any questions. Um, we're happy to pick up the phone and uh, and answer any of those questions that you might have. Next question, um, Monica's really prodding us to to go down this road. Um, is there some controversy about sea buckthorn? Can't remember as to why myself. So. <laughs> I think that uh, some of the folks in our province, Monica, Alberta, um, are trying to make sea buckthorn an invasive weed. Uh, and, it, is in, it is in some counties now. Okay. And this is really unfortunate. It's probably one of the most useful plants. Uh, in permaculture, we talk about plant guilds where we 
take a plant like an apple tree and we'll co-plant it with things like rhubarb and um, pumpkins and um, saskatoons and honeyberries. Sea buckthorn, in my opinion, is the only plant that can be a guild of its own. And so you can plant sea buckthorn with sea buckthorn with sea buckthorn with sea buckthorn because it does so many things. So it's a nitrogen fixer. It has one of the most medicinal berries. They taste incredible. You can, the leaves are worth $17 an ounce for tea at Community Natural Foods. Uh, and you can Google what you get when you drink tea from a sea buckthorn. Um, they're uh, drought resilient. Um, they are compostable, which means you can cut them and they come back. So you can use them for firewood. Um, they are uh, a fence, a living fence. So they'll keep your animals in because they got spikes on them. Um, they're wind resistant, they're wind break. I mean, like it just goes on and on and on and on. If you want, you can, I, I'm not gonna say that. Um, anyways, so they're a really great plant and uh, we should actually fight for it. We should fight to prevent it from becoming um, on the invasive list. Um, Dakota has got one of the best harvesting protocols for sea buckthorn I've ever seen. I did it for the first time this year. And uh, I have two giant bags of sea buckthorn in my freezer right now because of him. Uh, and not only did I get a berry yield out of it, but I got a tea, tea leaf uh, yield out of it. And, um, and then I also got a, um, a kindling yield out of it. I got three things for very little labor. So check out some of these, these berry porn pictures that he's gonna show. <laughs> So this is um, essentially you um, you cut the, the branches uh, right off the tree, just like this, and you throw these into a deep freeze overnight. They freeze solid, you hit them with a stick and all the berries and the leaves shatter off. And then you basically winnow them with a fan. So the heavy things drop right through, the light things uh, blow away and uh, it's really easy to separate. You get pure berries, oops, and pure tea, just like that from these guys. And this is a seven gallon bucket of berries that I processed in like an hour and a half or something. It was like crazy, just by myself. Um, and uh, we mix that with, you know, some of the other berries that we grow on the farm uh, that we harvest in a similar process. Uh, and you get these just perfect berries that um, they're like, it's like many times more vitamin C than oranges. They're one of the only berries in the world that has omega fatty acids in it. Did you mention that they're a nitrogen fixer as well? Yeah. Yeah, like, th like these, these plants are just, they're unbelievable. And, and they, they, so that the problem with them and the problem with all invasive species is that they're too good. Like, th like, the, so in agriculture, there's this joke that there's, uh, for the last 10,000 years, since we've been practicing agriculture, uh, humanity has forever been trying to solve two problems. How do I kill this thing that wants to live? And how do I keep this thing alive that wants to die? <laughs> That's what agriculture is. You know, we, we take these, these sheep and these canola and these, you know, just weak, the weakest species and we, we try to protect them from the stronger species that just want to come in and thrive. And when it doesn't work, we get mad and we pass laws. And we what do we do? We spray it with chemicals. Like, you know, all the counties in, in, in my area and in the world, uh, there's, there's a, a excellent book by Dow Ryan called The War on Invasives. And she goes through like the, the it's a, a conspiracy is the only other word that you can use to describe it. Like the the amount of chemicals that are used to keep things from living that want to live um, in worldwide is, is phenomenal. Um, and, um, and so the, the strategy is, is what if we just switched, what if we stopped fighting these things and instead tried to partner with them and, and turn them to productive use? Now, that's the one aspect of the other aspect of it is why are they invading? So <clears throat> there's a, th this is like the ultimate argument against invasive species is <clears throat> if there was such thing as an invasive species, there would only be one species on the planet right now after 4 billion years. Like 
the world is not about competition where humans are the only organism that has this concept of, of invasion and, and competition and, and uh, which is just utter nonsense. The, the, the rule in all these ecosystems is, is partnership. It, it is symbiosis. Um, it, even in the so-called, you know, parasitical relationships where one species is harmed and another is, is, um, is benefiting. Um, if you look deep enough, there actually quite often is some benefit there. And so <clears throat> what typically happens when a species invades is that there has, there's some kind of an imbalance in an ecosystem that created an opportunity for something else to move in. And quite often that imbalance comes from us because we don't, we're not all that smart because of what we're trying, we're trying to kill things that want to live and keep things alive that want to die. And as a result of that, we make a lot of poor decisions. So for example, zebra mussels are one of the, the better known uh, examples of invasive species. <clears throat> and here in Canada in the Great Lakes, they invaded uh, the Great Lakes. They came over from, it was, it was the uh, Orient, like Asia, places like that, where there are native species. Um, and they came over here and they just colonized the Great Lakes and they would, you know, basically cover the, the outlet pipes on factories, plugging them off. They're just unbelievably productive. Um, and for years, there was just this huge problem. If you step on them, they break and they, they cut your feet. And so there's, there's this huge war on, on trying to kill these things, but you couldn't, you can't fight nature. It's, it's been here for billions of years. It's going to win. Um, but what's interesting is, is um, Dow talks about this in, uh, goes into some more depth in her, in her book, is that um, one of the reasons why the zebra mussels were so prolific in the Great Lakes was because the Great Lakes were so dirty. Uh, you know, during the, you know, after the Industrial Revolution, we just dumped all of our garbage, raw effluent, uh, you know, whole cars, tires, and we just, we just dumped them into our lakes. And so the native species whose role in the ecosystem was to purify water, uh, which is what, a, what a, these, these mollusks do is they, they, they filter out nutrients from the water, pollution, nutrients is the same thing. Um, and, um, and they incorporate that into their bodies and, and other organisms benefit from it. The native species couldn't keep up with the amount of nutrients in the water and they started to die. This is happening all over the world right now. In freshwater mussel species and the endemic species are dying because they just can't handle it. Uh, so then what happens is that, that nature abhors a vacuum, a species moves in, it fulfills that function in the ecosystem. And because it's the, the slate is totally open to them because nothing else can handle it, there's so much nutrients, they go crazy. Now, as the environmental records and, and regulations around the Great Lakes areas have, has improved, Interestingly enough, these zebra mussels are dying and the native species are coming back because they're more adapted to the environment than the zebra mussels are in a, in a normal kind of healthy ecosystem environment. And so these zebra mussels were literally eating entire cars. That's how, how, how good they were. And now that the cars are gone and the garbage is cleaned up and, and we're not constantly dumping new stuff in, the environment shifts, it's no longer favorable to them and they disappear. So, um, and actually the, the, this is a really interesting um, segue into, um, you know, the, the, all the talk about the coronavirus and stuff right now is one of the, the uh, core beliefs in permaculture is that um, everything in, in the world serves a function, regardless of whether or not we understand it or not. That's like the, the base principle, everything has, serves a function and it has a right to exist, regardless of, of whether or not we can understand it. And this is where you get into interesting things like the difference between germ theory and terrain theory and the new uh, emerging science about what, what viruses are and, and how they actually might be incredibly beneficial and that they might be totally misunderstood. Um, and you, so the, the same pattern of humans trying to kill something that wants to live and keep something alive that wants to die, our, our childish approach to, to, to change and our fear of death is you know, driving a lot of these problems. And it, it's, it's costing us trillions of dollars, it's costing us our health, it's costing us our well being. Um, and so it's, it's just much easier. Figure out what wants to thrive in your area and partner with it.
that's that's permaculture in a nutshell. <laughs> so I'm gonna put that into a nutshell. Uh, Peace Love <laughs> says, I feel like I'm trying to drink water from a fire hose. <laughs> great work, guys. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh that's that's honestly what it's like uh you know we we've spent the last both of us have spent the last decade of our lives just absorbing this information and putting it to productive use and um it's a passion and so that's what you're really hearing when when we talk about this stuff is that we just love it like again i'm always admit i'm embarrassed to admit how often i mean <laughs> these live streams started because we end up in these really interesting conversations you're like Shh, shoot like we should be putting this on youtube right now like i wish we, just even for ourselves so that they were recorded somewhere because we just end up having these interesting debates and conversations about how all of these things fit together and um the world is definitely a lot more colorful than some people would like to admit especially when it comes to that invasive species conversation and honestly we could spend uh, a week every night sorry every night of the week for two hours talking about this this uh, conversation because it's mm -hmm. There's a lot there, um, and 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 the further down that road you go, the the, the faster you realize that uh, in, um, industrialization, agriculture, um, a lot of it is very adversarial and and based in war, um, and that's where Dow Ryan's book Beyond the War of Invasive Species comes from. Yeah. So we're uh, we're getting to the end of the call. I'm going to answer another question here quickly. Um, and end all disease. Man, thank you for all the comments. You've just been a, a rock star tonight, just like pounding them out there. It's great. Yeah. Uh, but you asked a question, um, and you obviously know a lot about nutrition too. I've been watching your comments, so thanks for those. Uh, you asked a question about whether you should join the PDC, uh, even though you don't like Facebook. Absolutely. Um, the website has a really great chat function. We just upgraded it, and um, uh, there's going to be lots of chat going on on the Zoom calls. Um, there's a, a chat function there to be able to commun communicate with folks. And our goal is to, that you're actually going to get on the phone sometimes and talk to some of your fellow students. So mm -hmm. I think you're going to get tons of value out of it. And uh, I, yeah, I highly I, encourage it. The, the Facebook chat function, it, it, and this is like, I don't get any value out of Facebook either. I'm much more of a, a live, like some people like that, but other people don't. And so um, there's basically zero value attributed to the Facebook group in, in, in my opinion, but there's, you'll get so much more out of the course from everything. Like I said, there's, there's over a hundred hours of content in this course uh, that you're going to be getting. So, you know, it's like a, a few dollars an hour just for the, the, the lectures and where we'll be going through all these, these thoughts and ideas like that, but, but with, you know, slideshows and and stories from every different you know we've got a soil health expert we've got an urban gardening expert we've got um uh we've got a um uh trying to think of a word to describe sarah dent she's uh basically mm -hmm. she's yeah like a community expert but she's she's basically she's built a revolution of young farmers and know and understands how to how to apply the concept of permaculture to running like a social organization, like every single aspect. Per there, one of the jokes that uh, Rob and I have is that that when somebody asks, well, "What is permaculture?" <laughs> it's like, "Well, sit down for. Do you have a hundred hours? Because that's how long <laughs> it's going to take for me to explain uh, this to you." Um, and the, the second uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek explanation I give is, um, "Permaculture is the science of everything." <laughs> so <clears throat> there's and just like myself personally, I've taken uh, three paid PDCs. So I took a PDC with um, uh, in British Columbia in person. I took uh, a live online and live interactive course with Jeff Lawton. I took uh, the PDC from Rob Michelle years ago as well. I've t I've listened to um, you know Bill Malson's two of Bill Malson's recorded PDCs. Um, online so it's like that's uh, like 600 hours of uh of content and i've listened to all of them the recorded ones more than once like and i still i still pick up new stuff every time you know i hear rob explain a, a concept in a different way or another's teacher so like, even if you've already taken a, a, a permaculture design course if you've never taken one from rob michelle i this this is probably the best money you could ever spend is because it's so um they're they're 
the level of, of profession, professionalism that they apply to everything and the rigor. And, <clears throat> and in this course, it's unique because there's so many, like typically there's only you know two or three instructors for the entire program. With this, because it's online, we're able to get in experts on all these different fields where we're normally, uh, you know, somebody would have to kind of step outside of their, their field of expertise. But in, in this course, um, nobody is talking about any uh, content in this field that doesn't come from direct experience, which is pretty unique for a, a, a permaculture design course. Yeah, awesome. Um, thanks for that, Dakota. That was great. Um, so the last question is from um, endalldisease.com. Uh, what is the purpose of life? <laughs> so the, there's a, there's an interesting quote from uh, the physicist Nassim Haramein, uh, which is that uh, uh, he says, I am the universe learning about itself. And, and for me, that's what, that's at a base level, that's what life is. It is, it is us and all the organisms learning about themselves in this like fractal thing where it's like we literally are the universe but we're a part of it and we're all kind of growing and learning together um so that's that's my particular uh philosophy when it comes to this stuff rob what's what's your uh answer to that i'm still figuring it out but i can tell you <laughs> it's, it's it's uh it's about having a whole bunch of fun and, and pursuing your passion and, and not wasting a single hour. That's what I figured out so far. Um, I want to um, make one more comment about all this. Um, something that we're going to aim to do in this course is um, make all the audio files available. So if you can't come to a visual lecture, you're going to be able to listen to this course. Um, so we're going to produce MP3s and uh, we really want to make this content as approachable as possible. And uh, the way we're going to change the world is to take advantage of these crises. A crisis is a horrible thing to waste. And uh, we have an opportunity now to create, to plant seeds in hundreds of communities across Canada, the United States, anywhere that people are taking this content. Um, we can make it really affordable by doing it online. Um, and with all of our programs, with all of our PDCs, we encourage our students to go on and teach. We encourage our students to go on and consult. Um, you can check out all of our um, case studies from our past students and what they actually do. People always ask us, do you give a certificate? Absolutely, we're certified. Jeff Lawton taught me, I'm, I'm one of his students. Um, Mollison's original intention was that people who took the 72 hour program could go on and teach it once they felt comfortable to stand in front of a group, group of people and teach it for 72 hours. It's a design process. Um, but ultimately the value of any program is what um, the students do on the back end. That's our report card. And we have hundreds of students right across this country, Canada, uh, and even some in the US now, who are changing the world, changing their community, one course, one landscape at a time. And I am, I am getting absolutely inundated with consultancy calls right now. I cannot even believe it. I'm, I, uh, I'm not sure how I'm gonna answer them all, um, to be totally honest with you. And so I think that on the back end of this crisis, um, the people that start engaging with these systems, start engaging with their ecologies and start changing their communities will be busy for the rest of their lives. And if you're like me and like Dakota, it is one of the most enjoyable pursuits I've ever found in my life. I, I cannot stop thinking about these things. And so I'm just so thrilled to have the opportunity to share my knowledge, Dakota's knowledge, all these incredible instructors that are going to be guiding you over the next three months as we navigate this crisis together and we come up with solutions and opportunities um, to turn the problems into uh, opportunities mm -hmm. um, it's an incredible time to be alive right now yeah and the just one more thing i'll i'll add to that is um, uh, permaculture isn't something that you do um or sorry we come step back. Um, you don't do permaculture. You use permaculture in what you do. 
So whether you're a massage therapist or a teacher or a mechanic or a farmer or whatever it is, the thoughts and principles about ecosystems, um, how they function, how you can, you can partner with them more effectively, they apply to any occupation in the world. And as Rob said, more than ever, um, the, uh, the cracks that are starting to show up uh, are not starting, are, are, are breaking apart right now in our world right now, um, I believe are um, the, an accumulation of uh, decades, if not centuries of an old paradigm that saw humans as separate and above uh, from natural systems as, a, as opposed to uh, an integral uh, part of, of an interdependent set of relationships. And so the new world that we need to build needs all of our, I, I believe, and I'm obviously I'm biased, but um, I think you can make a pretty good case for it that, that um, uh, all of the occupations that we're going to have in this new era that we're going to have to rebuild from um, are going to have to be grounded in ecology because after all civilization is part of ecology and i think that's that's the problem is that we've we've again coming back to agriculture it's like we're we're literally trying to to to, to kill things we're in, a, we're in a war against the world and and like the scary thing is we're winning <laughs> uh because we're in a you know winning in that we're we're you know losing biodiversity but um uh, all of these things, the reason why Rob and I are also so optimistic about this and we don't bother to get stuck in the doom and gloom is because there's, there's nothing but hope. Like, like all these problems in less than 10 years, we, we could turn this whole thing around. Like there's, there's no doubt. It's, this is the easiest thing in the world to do. The problem is, is our thinking. And uh, that's what this permaculture course is about. It, it teaches you a new way to, uh, Think about the world and your place within it that is applicable to, to anyone. Absolutely, folks. Well, thanks so much for joining us this evening, guys, for the last two hours. I hope you got some value out of it. If you did, hit the like button for us. It helps the video to, to track a little better. Um, we uh, reached the peak of 70 people on this call, which is amazing. Um, it, it's so hard to get 70 people into a, into a room and have a conversation. So it's so lovely that uh, YouTube has made this available to us. Um, just want to thank you guys all for, for what you do in, in your own communities and uh, stay positive, stay healthy, and uh, we'll see you guys again. We're doing this weekly, so you'll see us sometime next week. We'll send a notification out on our newsletter um, shortly. Okay. Take care, folks.